All right, welcome Grace Point to Thursday Night Bible Study. We're going to begin our study in the book of Matthew. just want to kind of dive right in. Father, thank you for your blessing. Thank you for your anointing. Thank you for revelation, knowledge, and information being imparted, God. Let, let it flow through me in Jesus' name, Lord, and let it bring understanding to the hearer in Jesus' name. Amen. Really excited to do the book of Matthew. I've done a study on it before, went through the whole book. And Matthew is a book that's rooted in the Old Testament. There's 54 direct citations from the Old Testament, and there's at least minimal 262 allusions uh, to the Old Testament. One of the, the main themes of the book of Matthew is the fulfillment theme, that Jesus is the fulfillment of of the messianic promises in the Old Testament. And you're going to see that over and over and over. He is fulfilling the Old Testament. He is fulfilling the Old Covenant. And he's actually bringing in a new. And we're going to repeat that over and over. It definitely has a Jewish flavor. Matthew, the writer, def he has the Jew a Jewish audience in mind. If there was ever a book of the Bible written to the Jews and for the Jews, it is the book of Matthew. So it's powerful. The book is divided up into three parts, the person, the proclamation, and the passion of Jesus. The first four chapters, person, 4 through 16, the proclamation, and 16 through 28, the passion of Jesus. And there's other uh, things sprinkled in there, but that's a rough outline of the book. So, and the book starts off uh, with the genealogy. Let's just get right into it. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So you see right there, Jace, it's anchored immediately in the Old Testament. He's saying that Jesus, and get this, we think of, when we say the record of Jesus Christ, we think of Christ being Jesus' last name. At least I do. You think, you know, Jace Fitzsands, I think, Jesus Christ. But that's re not really what's going on. Right out the get-go, he's saying, this is a record of Jesus, the Messiah. The Messiah. Christ meaning the anointed one or the Messiah. So he's talking about Jesus with the title of Messiah. And Matthew is a largely ap apologetic book. Matthew is going to defend this theme throughout the book. He is going to prove scripturally over and over again that Jesus is the Messiah. And, he, and immediately there's an apologetic because he calls him the son of David. And that's what this genealogy is about. He is going to demonstrate and prove to the audience that Jesus is the son of David. You can't be the Messiah unless you're the son of David. And you have to be Jewish. So he says the son of Abraham. The Jewish race really began with Abraham and the record of it started way back in Genesis chapter 12. This whole record of Jesus is rooted in space, time, history. It's not a myth. It's not mythology. There's real history. There's real historical dates. There's real historical people. And so Matthew, in a very apologetical way, is going to lay out this space, time, history about the Messiah. So Jesus is the Christ. He's the son of David, and he's the son of Abraham. And Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Abinadab. Abinadab, the father of Nation. Nation, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of King David. I'm going to read one more and just take a stop here. He says, David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. I'm going to stop there for a reason. You guys see something fascinating in this genealogy. Okay, so he takes the Christ, his origin from Abraham, the father of the Jews, and he goes all the way down to King David, showing you that, that Christ is a true heir of David. And he's going to go further from there. So he, he, he gives 14 generations from Abraham to David. 
notice in his genealogy, he mentions, very, he mentions women four times, and it's not by accident. He talks about Judah, whose mother was Tamar. Do you remember the story of Tamar in the Old Testament, Jace? Tamar was actually, it's okay, you can do it. <laughs> I don't mean to interrupt you. I'm just, it's, it's easy to talk to somebody. Tamar was actually Judah's daughter-in-law, and he didn't do right by her, so she disguised herself as a prostitute. She slept with her dad and had a baby by her father-in-law. And Matthew sticks it right here in the text, doesn't hide from it, throws it right in. And you go a little further, and he says, Salmon was the father of Boaz, he says, whose mother was Rahab. Rahab was a prostitute. So you've got a woman that sleeps with her father-in-law, disguises herself as a prostitute. Boom, the next woman he, men he mentions was a prostitute. Goes a little further, and he says, uh, Obed, whose mother was Ruth. What makes Ruth stand out? She was a Gentile. She was a Moabite. So you've got two prostitutes and a Gentile in the lineage of Jesus. Really amazing. And, and he's not hiding it. Uh, there's still that line going through the father, okay, of the kingship. But you've got this very interesting uh, interaction with women uh, in, uh, in the storyline. Then David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. And we know that's Bathsheba. What's spectacular about Bathsheba? She was an adulterer. David actually had Uriah killed in battle, and he slept with Bathsheba, Uriah's wife. And so Solomon was a product of adultery. Isn't that amazing? These four women, and it is not by accident that Matthew throws them into the lineage. Now, just as a side note, at this point in the genealogy in the Gospel of Luke, Luke uses Nathan rather than Solomon uh, as the bloodline. The reason Matthew was going to use Solomon is very interesting, is because Solomon was the rightful king. And what Matthew was trying to show us is that Jesus is the rightful king. So he's going to show the kingship of Jesus all the way through, okay? And that's why he, he uses Solomon instead of Nathan. He's going to show us that Jesus was the king. Okay, we, we'll go on. Solomon was the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam, father of Abijah. Abijah, the father of Asa. Asa of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the father of John. Or uh, Jehuram. Jehuram, the father of Uzziah. Uzziah, the father of Jotham. Jotham, the father of Ahaz. Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, Manasseh, the father of Ammon, Ammon, the father of Josiah, Josiah, the father of Jehoiada, Jehoiada, and his brother at the time of the exile. That's 14 more generations now, from David to the exiles, 14 from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile, and now there's going to be 14 more. And by the way, do you know... Uh, Jace, that he actually left out some names in this genealogy. There were names left out. Yeah, if you study, there was uh, names left out of it. And they, they say the reason they think that he did that is he wanted um, 14 generations, you know, from Abraham to David, 14 from David to exile, and 14 from exile to Christ, which is made up of two sevens. For some, it's, it's very systematic, and he wanted to block it off orderly, but... And this was common in genealogies where they would skip generations, and they did. You can see the actual genealogies in uh, Ruth chapter 4 and 1 Chronicles chapter 3 verse 20 where they'll lay out. Now you'll see the missing names in there. So uh, Matthew wasn't interested in getting every single name. He just wanted to show you that Jesus came from the Davidic line, and he was, had a, he was a rightful heir to the Davidic kingship or the Davidic throne. So leaving out names, and that, that actually happened uh, often when they were putting together genealogies back then. All right, and the last 14, it said, uh, after the exile, Jehoiada was the father of Shiltau, and Shiltau the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Abihud, 
Abihad, the father of Elikim, Elikim, the father of Azor, Azor, the father of Zadok, Zadok, the father of Achim, Achim, the father of Elihad, Elihad, the father of Eliezer, Eliezer, the father of Mathan, Mathan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. And that's what he's trying to establish, is that Jesus is called Christ. Isn't it interesting that he took us down through Joseph, not Mary. Mary was also in the, the lineage of Judah, but he took us down through Joseph. And again, he was trying to show us through the father's line that Jesus was rightful heir to kingship. Right down there through Joseph. And he said, but he does mention, and Mary of whom was born Jesus, who is called to Christ. Thus were 14 generations in all, from Abraham to David, 14 from David to exile, uh, Babylon, and 14 from exile to Christ. So it's very, put together very orderly. Okay, we're going we're gonna to move on. This is how the birth of Jesus came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together... She was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to put her away privately. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived of her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you will give him the name of Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be born uh, with child and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and she gave him the name Jesus. Okay, I'll bring out some points here. First of all, very important that we know, because we know that Jesus is fully God, and he's fully human. It's very important that the writer of Matthew points out that Jesus was born or conceived by the Holy Spirit. He did not have a human father. His father was God, and he was conceived and born by the power of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, because of this, obviously, now you think if you were Joseph and you found out that your wife was pregnant or the woman you were betrothed to was pregnant, wouldn't you um, be a little bit concerned if your girlfriend you were engaged to was pregnant and she said, well, I... I didn't have sex with anybody. God got me pregnant. <laughs> he said, yeah, right. And so already, I mean, Joseph is going to put her away. He's a righteous man. Being betrothed back in biblical times was different. When you were betrothed to somebody, you were already married. They just hadn't moved in yet. You just hadn't consummated. But you might be betrothed to them for a year, and then there'd be a day where you'd have some type of ceremony and she would come and she would move in with you. But she was already, for all intents and purposes, his wife. <clears throat> and he would have to divorce her and put her away. And Joseph, being a good man, a righteous man, did not want to bring shame on Mary. He wanted to do the right thing by her, but he didn't want to marry her, and understandably so. Now, there's two supernatural things that's going on here, Jace. Number one, Jesus is conceived by the Holy Spirit. And we're going to see the rest of this book. There is a supernatural element to the life of Jesus and to this gospel. And it's starting right here with his birth through the power of the Holy Spirit. You're either going to believe this guy or you're going to be a skeptic. You're either going to believe he was, he was born by the power of the Spirit you're going to believe in miracles or you're going to be a skeptic. I am amazed at Christians and people that don't believe in miracles when the whole gospel story from beginning to end is one miracle after another. And Joseph is no apostle, right? 
But immediately, God begins to guide him supernaturally through dreams. I think he has several dreams, I think up to four dreams. He has these dreams, and God begins to speak to him supernaturally and give him direction. So one, the child is born by the Holy Spirit. Two, now he had a, an angel visit him in a dream, telling him, don't be afraid to marry Mary, because what has been conceived of her is conceived by the Lord. Go ahead and marry her. And of course, we know he does that. And he even, again, he quotes the scripture out of Isaiah seven fourteen about a virgin giving birth to a son. And I'm not going to go into the actual word for virgin. Uh, there was a, the, word, the Hebrew word used wasn't the normal word that was used for virgin in this situation. Uh, but it was a woman. It was a, also it was a word not used for a wife or someone married. It's a very interesting word. And uh, they speculate sometimes why they just didn't use the word, the plain word for virgin. But um, it could be used for virgin. And Matthew just says, no, she's a virgin. And he quotes it as virgin. And he says, through this, God will be with us, which tells us about the deity of Christ. And Matthew's going to come back to this theme, quoting scripture again and again, that Jesus is not only man, but he is the son of God, or he is deity. He is God with us. Now, it's interesting. Uh, he's told to give him the name Jesus. The name Jesus means, you know, Jehovah saves. And he said that he would save us from our sins. Let me ask you a question, Jace. Were the Jewish people at this time looking for someone to save them from their sins? What were they looking for? It's going to be very important as we go forward in the text. What's that? They were looking for a king. They were looking for a Messiah. And right away, we see the tone set in the Gospel of Matthew. It said that Jesus, God with us, he is going to save us from our sins. And that's God's focus. The focus wasn't that Jesus is going to save us from Rome. Jesus is going to establish his kingship physically. Right away, we see that Jesus is our Savior, and he is going to save us from our sins. And of course, um, they didn't have any union until Jesus was actually born. She remained a virgin until Jesus was born, and Joseph respected that as well. All right, I'm going to end right here in chapter 1. I'm not going to go any further uh, tonight. I just want to end it right there in chapter 1, and we're going to pick up next week. And uh, just letting you know, it's going to start off a little slow. I'm going to get more into topics as we go along. I'm just trying to lay a foundation. So just a couple of things in review. I want you to know that you're going to notice again and again that Jesus is the Christ and he is coming in fulfillment of the scriptures. You're going to notice that this book is rooted uh, in Jewish history, in Jewish scriptures, and it's written uh, to a Jewish audience. And you're going to notice um, all the supernatural elements to the life of Jesus. The miraculous is going to constantly be on display in Jesus's life. And as we go forward, you'll be seeing this more and more. All right, that's enough for tonight. Come back next week and we'll pick up in chapter two.